Program Director, I just want to correct you. I'm not an honourable member. I'm a servant of a people. And the honourable members remain honourable members in Parliament, but we are outside. We are servants of a people. Secondly, I want to greet you in the South African tradition and maybe even teach you a couple of Afrikaans or Xhosa words. So I'm going to say to you, good afternoon. Goeiemiddag. San Bunani. Now, in saying that I'm a servant of a people, I want to say it was the health care, uh, the lack of health care in our country that actually got me into politics 10 years ago. It is the failure, failing health care system that I feel we must all live to the words of Mahatma Gandhi, a we have to be the change that we wish to see. In August 2014, a fellow member of the National Assembly of the Parliament of the Republic of South Africa, Dr. Mario Oriani Ambrosini, who was in the last stages of terminal lung cancer, decided to end his life suffering and took his own life with a gunshot to the head. In a subsequent statement, his family affirmed that Ambrosini's decision was, and I quote, a positive and very conscious decision on his part. He did not want to suffer anymore, nor did his family. His choice was made not of weakness, fear or despair, but from his courage and determination to be the final decision maker concerning his own fate. However, in respect of the means that Mario was forced to utilize to end his pain and suffering, a gunshot to the head, his wife Karen publicly said, and I quote, no one can quite imagine the trauma. That shot and blood everywhere you looked, it shocked every bit of humanity in you. Mario tried everything. He could do no more. The cancer was everywhere, his lungs, his stomach, his legs, everywhere. Everything in him stopped working. It robbed him of his dignity, especially for his child to see him like this. He was in emotional conflict, in unbearable pain, and on the brink of death that would not come gently, quickly, or easily. It could have been so different. Imagine if we who loved him could hold his hand, hug him for a last time, while a doctor injected him and released him peacefully from all this suffering. That's what we do for our animals when they suffer. Why not also for people? Close quote. Now history will recall the role that Mario played in the negotiations that moved South Africa from the apartheid pariah state it was to the constitutional democracy it is today, crafting our globally acclaimed and progressive constitution which is underpinned by a Bill of Rights. And history will also recall that it was the tenacious determination of Mario Ambrosini who fought all the way to our constitutional court for the right of members of parliament to introduce in their individual capacity bills into parliament for consideration and possible adoption as law. So, in ill health and in death, my colleague, Mario Ambrosini, has left us all with a legacy. Be it in protecting the basic tenets of values of our Constitution, be it in perusing and exercising the rights of members to submit private members' bills, be it in perusing the Medical Innovation Bill and ensuring its enactment, or be it in perusing and ensuring the right of a terminally ill to terminate their suffering and to die and I paraphrase, with words attributed to our very own Mario Ambrosini, in peace and serenity, surrounded by the love of family and friends, I'm dying at a time when I feel ready, close quote. Now, currently South Africa, despite its human rights-based constitution, has no explicit dying with dignity legislation. 
This is despite an extensive project that was undertaken by the Law Reform Commission at the request of then President Nelson Mandela in the mid-1990s, like Professor Landman stated earlier this morning. Now, following through public consultation and an investigation into then international best practice, the Commission recommended the enactment of an end-of-life decision bill. For reasons that are not clear, neither the country's executive nor its parliament pursued the matter at that time. And sadly, our revered Medipa, Nelson Mandela, lingered for months, hooked up to a machine after doctors declared him to be in a permanent vegetative state. Some 20 years have passed since the tabling of a law reform report, and this despite our human rights based constitution, which compels the state to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights enshrined in our constitution, and despite advocacy work by, amongst others, Dignity South Africa. Amongst these rights that impact on the right to die with dignity are the inherent right to dignity and to have one's dignity respected and protected, the right to life in respect of which death is an undeniable and ultimate part, and the right to freedom and security of a person, which includes the right not to be treated in a cruel, inhumane, or degrading way, and to have one's bodily and psychological integrity respected, which includes the right to security and control over one's body. As South Africa, and the world mark the centenary of the birth of our beloved Madiba Nelson Mandela. It seems appropriate, albeit long overdue, to reinitiate the ideas contained in the Law Commission's report, and to do so using the right fought for by the late Mario Ambrosini that members of parliament may introduce private members' bills. Our constitution pointedly provides that our National Assembly is elected to represent the people under the constitution, and that it does this amongst other means by providing a national forum for the consideration of issues and by passing legislation. It was with this in mind, and having my own dad and nursing my own dad at home right to the end, the seed planted by Dr. Sean Davison, as well as my own diagnosis with early stage breast cancer, that I approached my political party, the Congress of the People, with a view of introducing this controversial private member's bill on dying with dignity, as well as the Civil Unions Act to amend that at the same time, which would allow for same-sex couples to get married or be married by um, government officials who had the right to refuse to marry same-sex couples. Now, COPE was formed in defense of our constitutional order and the advancements of its objectives, which included the progressive realization of a human rights enshrined in our constitution and Bill of Rights. Now, having obtained the wholehearted support from my party, I approached Dignity South Africa with a view to collaborating with them to introduce the National Health Amendment Act into Parliament, which aims to provide for the legal clarity, status, and enforceability of advanced healthcare directives in form of living wills and durable power of attorneys for healthcare. And I have totally not used my PowerPoint. <laughs> and I have to say this for the press present. I need to emphasize that this bill is restricted to seeking legal clarity, status, and enforceability of advanced healthcare directives. It is not, as some of the media portrayed, a bill to legalize active euthanasia. It is not a bill to authorize or make legal assisted suicide. This current one is absolutely about advanced um, directives, durable power of attorney, and li well, living wills. <coughs> This living will to our media friends will seek to ensure that the wish wishes of an individual regarding healthcare options 
made when the individual is able to exercise a, a rational choice be respected in the event that at some future point the individual is no longer able to exercise or express such rational choices. Now, having said that, I'm sure that I speak on behalf of Dignity South Africa and myself when I say that we have been more than pleased with the media coverage that has been afforded to this initiative and the overwhelming public response and the support of this bill. Yes, we have received a whopping 11,420 representations. In the response to the call for comment on the explanatory summary of this bill, an unprecedented number for a bill of this nature. The vast majority of these representations, 8,792, which is 77%, expressed their support for the bill. The 23% were not really talking about the living will. They were actually talking about national health insurance and saying that it cannot happen because the healthcare system is already failing. So they didn't even know it was about a living will. And more than 60% of the people who I've contacted, and because I replied to every 11,000 emails, and I said to them, but this is not what we're trying to achieve. This is what we're trying to achieve. And they would reply by saying, oh no, but I've got a living will, I support it. So it is actually a lot more than 77%. Many of these representations contain personal accounts of trauma, pain, unnecessary suffering, experienced by family and patients alike at the refusal of treating medical doctors to honour advanced directives. I'm going to stop here and just give you one example. Uh, one of the submissions, the gentleman made contact with me and he said to me, it is so sad that when my mother-in-law had a stroke, she was resuscitated. Although she had a living will and she had a clear do not resuscitate. They did in fact resuscitate her and they kept her hooked up to a machine for 90 days until her medical aid was exhausted. Having said that, one must acknowledge that the current provisions of our National Health Act does provide for the right of a user to reviews, refuse health services and provides that a health service may not be provided to a user without the user's informed consent where the patient can speak for themselves. So I want to repeat, it does allow for a patient to say, I don't want treatment, I don't want chemo, I don't want radiation. But what happens when I'm in a coma and I cannot say, I don't want a ventilator? The act is, however, very silent when the, when the patient is no longer able to speak for themselves. What is lacking in the current provisions of the act is for explicit legal recognition and enforceability of advanced healthcare directives, thus protecting the patient's human right, as well as protecting medical practitioners when they act on an advanced directive. And as our own South African dying with dignity advocate and Joan of Arc, and I don't see her, am I blind? There she is. Lee Last has noted the vast majority are these instances of a refusal to honour advanced healthcare directives occur within our private sector, medical aid or insurances, and not in our public healthcare system. I have seen it so many times where patients are sent home when I think there is still hope in our government system. But it doesn't happen in the private healthcare that much. It brings to mind the Irish proverb that reads, death is the poor man's doctor. 
I've listened to the presentations in the last day and a half, and what comes through this is the following. We are talking about a return to the most fundamental of rights, liberty of a person and self-determination, and that religion, politics, and the state are the greatest threats to re-establishing liberty of a person. What differentiates South Africa from many democracies is the supremacy of our constitution. And I am confident that Parliament will enact the bill to legally recognize advanced directives. And this is not part of a script, and I must say my researcher really keep me to script because I always put my foot into it, okay? And if Parliament does not enact it, then we have tried all avenues, and we will go and we will do it in the courts. But religion and politics will dictate that as matters stand, the legalization of euthanasia lies in our courts, declaring euthanasia to constitute a right given our Bill of Rights and directing Parliament to adopt enabling legislations. Well, Carol, I want to say to you, believe me, I will not stop harassing Minister Mutsaledi. And I want to also tell you that I'm planning two more private members' bills. And one of them is for our medical aids. It is not right that a medical aid can offer us an umbrella when the sun is shining. But the minute we find that there is a little bit of clouds or a storm on the horizon, the medical aids close the umbrella. And when the thunderstorm is there, I've seen it sitting in oncology, in x-ray department, where stage four patients are refused any further assistance by, their, assistance by their medical aids when they still need that little bit of hope. We cannot allow medical aids to take away the umbrella if, when you need it the most. Program director, as I conclude, I must take the opportunity to firstly thank Professor Willem Lundman, COPE's researcher Roger, and in absentia, Daksha Kassan, and the rest of the parliamentary legal team who has provided wise counsel and advice in the drafting of this private member's bill. In this process, I'm only pushing the pram. The baby belongs to the people of South Africa and advocacy groups such as Dignity South Africa. Whilst the bill represents a small but significant step for man in matters related to the end of life decisions. My hope is that it will foster greater debate and ultimately lead to a giant leap for mankind in respect of a right to die with dignity in South Africa. Thank you.